sharing with you some of your um um some 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 of the the, the research I'm doing. Now, I noted that three years ago, approximately, uh, my late father Arnold came and spoke to you. Maybe he did speak to you either in person or Zoom. I don't know. In March 2020, whether it was before or during lockdown, I can't remember. But he spoke or was supposed to speak about uh, Persian carpets, Persian carpets uh, in March 2020. And there's one one connecting link between his talk about Persian carpets and my talk today, which is going to discuss manuscripts. And that is that the same places that carpets go, manuscripts go. Wherever a person takes a carpet, that's where he takes his manuscripts. Um, and so anything that we know about carpets traveling across Iran and Central Asia, through China and India and everywhere else, will also be true about Jewish manuscripts. Okay, so let's let's kick it off. So the first thing to uh, or I want to explain, what is Judeo-Persian? Judeo-Persian is Persian that's written in Hebrew letters. So it's the Persian that they speak in Iran today and have spoken and written in Iran for the last thousand years, uh, but it's written in Hebrew letters. That's it. Just like Judeo-Arabic, it's Arabic, but it's written in Hebrew letters. Okay, so you've already um, heard a little bit about me. That's uh, the, the detail of my first degree. I was supervised by uh, Professor Charles Melville in Cambridge. And then in Edinburgh, uh, Professor Hamin Antilla supervised me. And now my supervisor is Professor Shabin Farid Najad in Hamburg University. And I'm also going to be working with Professor Ronnie Volant in Munich University, um, who's the Professor there of Jewish Studies. And that's my the topic. At the bottom there, you can see uh, the formal title of my research. So I'm I'm analyzing Shahin's use of the Rishonim and their sources in his two Judeo-Persian Masnavi poems. Um, and I'll explain what the Masnavi is in a sec. Um, the first work that uh, Shahin wrote was called Musa Nameh, written in 1327. And the second one that he wrote was called Ada Shunami, and he wrote that in 1333. Um, the Masnavi is a long epic poem. So it's a, it's a Persian genre of poetry, and it's a long epic po poem, often romantic, often historic, often didactic. It can be any of those or all of those. Um, uh, the, the, most, the nearest comparison we have in England, in, in English literature, to a Masnavi would be um, an epic poem such as Paradise Lost, written by Milton. It's a long, 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 long poem. So before we sort of start talking about Shaheen, I just want to put him into the context of Jewish output in, in Iran and during the time that he lived. He lived during the Ilkhanate, which was the Mongol empire that controlled Iran in the 1300s, late 1200s, early 1300s. And there are three basically major streams of Jewish output in that empire at that time. And Shahin represents one of them. Well, the first one on the left is Rashid al-Din. Rashid al-Din, you may or may not have heard of, some of you may sh should have, any historians should have heard of him. He's considered to be the first great world historian. He was born Jewish. Uh, he grew up Jewish, had a Jewish education in Hamadan. Um, and uh, there's a dispute as to whether or not he converted or when, well, or no, he did convert, but when, no one really knows, but he did convert at some point to uh, become Muslim. And he became the senior senior minister of the Ilkhanate em emperor of the time. Uh, he eventually had his head chopped off in 1318, uh, but before that happened, he, um, he wrote the first great world history, uh, which is called Jami'at Tabarikh, and that was written approximately between 1300 and 1310, and in it, he includes a small section about the history of the Jews. 
allegedly using Jewish sources. Then we have Shaheen, who is a poet living at the time from certainly he was probably born about 1300. His last work was written in 1359. And then the third stream is just what we would expect, Jewish scribes sitting around either writing original works of, of rabbinical texts or copying out existing rabbinical texts written by other people. And one of the works that uh, we know came from Iran at this time um, is a collection of Midrash. Um, it's become quite well known in recent years. This is a recent edition of it. It's called Midrash, Pitran Torah, uh, I'm not sure what it really is from Rabhai Gaon, but that's the traditional um, assertion. And, and this Midrash um, is a manuscript currently held in the National Library of Israel, who acquired it in the uh, very early 1970s uh, from a very elderly Iranian gentleman who made Aliyah. And he had his family had held this manuscript for God knows how many years. Uh, it's been dated to 1328, and it's full of Midrashic content on the five books. We are, know of no copy of that collection of Midrashim from anywhere else except from Iran. So that's a unique piece of rabbinical output from Iran at this time. So that's one example. Um, so those are the three main streams of what was going on in Iran at the time, Jewish-wise. So Rashid al-Din is very famous. He gets a lot of attention from historians of the period. Um, and as I said, he included a few pages on the history of the Jews. Uh, the most recent book about his world history is called Making Mongol History. It was published by uh, Edinburgh University Press in 2021. I do, I do have a copy of that. Hold on. Okay, this book, Making Mongol History. It's written in English, so it's nice and easy. And the guy that wrote that is called Stefan Kamola. And it tells you everything you want to know about Rashid Dean and his uh, world history. In his appendix there, he lists all the manuscripts. Um, there was an Austrian, um, I think it was Austrian, um, Austrian academic, who um, published in 1973 um, a couple of those manuscripts in a book uh, which he called Die Geschichte der Kinder Israels des Rashid uh, which means the history of the children of Israel from Rashid Adin. And we also have um, Arabic manuscripts. This work, this great world history that Rashid Adin wrote, he wanted to preserve his, um, his legacy. And so he paid money, he left money in his will for people to make copies of his world history, both in Persian and in Arabic. And people made copies. And so we have this text survives not only in Persian, it also survives in Arabic. And one of the most famous manuscripts that we have of Rashid al history of the Jews is actually in Arabic. Half of it is held in Edinburgh, MS Arab 20. And the other half is held in the Khalili collection, who bought it, the Khalili, David Khalili, who's Jewish. He bought it, he bought the manuscript off the uh, India office, who previously owned the, that half of the manuscript. And there it's called MS-727, and that folios um, up to 59A, uh, you've got the history of the Jewish people. And that particular manuscript is very famous because it's got a lot of illuminations. Um, uh, which is like nice drawings of pictures of Moses being born and stuff like that. Moving on, um, so we haven't, no one's actually done any analysis on on what, if any, Jewish sources which he then really did use in that those 10 pages of his history. Carl uh, Jan said in his book that obviously she grew up Jewish, he would have received a full Jewish education in Hamadan. Um, but Kamola, in his book, Research Again, Making Mongol History, he argues that actually um, a lot of the text that 
we see in Rashidin's history is actually quite similar to another history written a few years earlier by a Persian historian called Karshani. And so, as you can see on the on the slide, um, if we're going to ever work out whether or not Rashid al-Din uh, wrote that section of his history himself, and what, if any, Jewish sources he used, um, someone's going to going to have to go and compare in quite some detail what Karshani wrote about his history of the Jews, and what Rashid al-Din wrote in his history of the Jews, and try and see where they got that information from. Um, so that's Rashid al-Din, he's uh, incredibly famous. Now we'll move on to Shaheen. He's actually, uh, his full title in amongst Iranian Jews is Maulana Shaheen Shirazi, which means our master, our, our amazing genius, um, Shaheen of Shiraz. There's actually no evidence that he came from Shiraz, which is a city in southwest Iran. Um, but Shiraz is traditionally a city of, of poets. He's the first known named poet that we have who wrote in Judeo Persian. And he wrote three Masnavi poems, which, as I said, are long epic poems. First one is today called Musaname, written in 1327. The second one is called Ada Shirname, written in 1333. And the final one is called Bereshitname, and that was written in 1359. Now, Shaheen did not give those names to those books. Um, historically, Iranian Jews would have called his poetry uh, just Shaheen al Hatorah or Kitabi Shaheen, meaning the Book of Shaheen. Um, these names were given to the books by an academic who I'll tell you about on the next slide, um, who first studied these works um, about 100 years ago, Rabbi Dr. Wilhelm Bacha, who was a Hungarian rabbi. Anyhow, so I'll tell you about these works in a bit more detail on the next slide, but for now, just to try and put Shaheen into a bit of context, he tells us very little about himself. But the very little information he does tell us is he mentions a gentleman by the name of Rabbi Yosef of Tbilisi, who he says um, in the introduction to his second work, Art the Shinami of 1333, he says um, on that work, at the introductory chapters, he says that he gave him a book. So the clear suggestion is that this Rabbi Yosef of Tbilisi was a friend or a teacher or a mentor or some kind of study partner of Shaheen. Now we know from other sources that this Rabbi Yosef had a son called Yeshaya. And this Rabbi Yeshaya lived in Tabriz, which is actually inside Northwest Iran. Tbilisi, as you know, is in Georgia, uh, somewhat further north. Now Yeshaya, the son of Rabbi Yosef of Tbilisi, um, wrote his books of Kabbalah uh, in the period 1324 to 1352. So we have, we do have one example, one very concrete example of a contemporary of Shaheen writing, uh, if you will, rabbinical works inside Iran at the same time. And I've discussed the, their whole connection and, and some more detail on the media in my master's dissertation and the details about the bottom of the page. Now I'll go through each of the works in turn and just tell you a little bit about them. We'll start with the Musaname. Um, this is a book that's split into four parts. It basically tells us the story of the latter four books of the five books of Moses. So Shemot, Bayukha, Bamidba, and Tavoim. Um, the poem runs to about 10,000 lines of classical Persian poetry. So uh, the manuscript I'm currently transcribing, that works out at 255 folios, with uh, a folio being two, two pages, two sides. And on each side, there's about 25 lines of poetry. Um, that was written in 1327. 
And it's traditional in these long poems to have introductory paragraphs, introductory chapters, praising all the people that need to be praised. Obviously, starting with God, Moses, Aaron, and uh, the emperor, Ilkhan Abu Sa'id, who was the emperor at the time. Abu Sa'id Bahadur, he was the emperor from 1317 until 1335. In terms of how the work splits out, Shemot comprises not far short of half the work. Um, Bayikra takes up only six folios, about 250 lines. Incredibly short section. And then the Midbar and Devorim take up the rest. So a quarter of the work each is devoted to the Midbar and Devorim. Um, so now this tells you something. Um, one of the essential elements of these works is that he puts in a lot of Midrashic material um, and he, he elaborates all of these stories in lovely poetry in Persian and he uses a lot of Midrashic material. And obviously, although Vayikra has a very old Midrash collection called Vayikra Rabba, which we know is extremely old, um, the content is somewhat of Vayikra, the book at least, is, is very halachic. Um, very dry by comparison with Shemot, uh, certain. Not many exciting stories in Vayikra. It's all about sacrifices and co uh, the, the garments of the priests, etc. So he didn't have a huge amount to, to write to interest his readers or what he felt would interest his readers. So he, he had only a very short section in Vayikra and devoted the rest of the work to the other three books. Now, the next thing, the next point to note, which is um, important and sad, but it's just a fact of life. Um, the works were written in the early 1300s, but the earliest manuscripts, the manuscripts that we have, are much, much later. In fact, I think this probably is one of the uh, is is perhaps the earliest manuscript we have for any of his works. Uh, we have the, a manuscript of Musa Narmay dated to 1550, which is currently held in St. Petersburg in Russia, in the Russian National Library. And all of the other manuscripts that we have for Shahin's works are later than that. Um, and I'll see more of that in a minute. Now, uh, Shahin's second work, which he wrote in 1333, is the work that I've spent most time studying and researching to date. Um, it's called Ardashir Nome. Ardashir is the Persian name for the king that we know as Ahasuerus. And Nome is the Persian word for a letter, where in this context means more like a story, so a book. Um, so it's the book of Ardashir or the book of Ahasuerus. And this poem is split also into four parts. Um, and it's a little bit shorter, only 6,500 lines of poetry. And the first part is gives us the Iranian mythical ancestry of King Ardashir or Ahasuerus. And here um, Shahin used his uh, material that he, he can get from other Persian poets that preceded him, people like Theodosi um, and Nizami, who were very famous uh, Persian poets. Theodosi wrote a uh, world famous work called the, the Book of Kings, the Shah Name. And so a lot of the material in that first section of Ardashinami comes from there. It gives all the back backstory of some of the early kings that uh, populate Iranian mythology. Um, the second story is the story of Megillah Esther. That takes up uh, slightly more than 50% of the whole, the whole work. And that has been published once uh, in, from a single manuscript um, in 1907 by Rabbi Shimon Chacham in Jerusalem. He had one manuscript which he used. Uh, he doesn't tell us anything about it. And he 
only published the story up until the end of the section on the Gila Esther. Um, it's actually not very available either. Uh, if you want to get it in the shops, you'll have to pay a lot of money. Um, uh, they have a copy in the National Library. Um, the third section of the, this poem is called The Story of Shiro and Mahasad. Shiro, um, Shaheen makes this character Shiro um, the son of Vashti. And uh, as far as we know, that's a completely fictional character. But he creates this son of Vashti who falls in love with a Chinese princess called Mahasad. And they run off, they have a lot of exciting adventures, uh, fighting animals and fighting armies, and falling down pits and getting captured and released. Um, and they travel back and forth between Iran and, and China. And this is basically um, the part of the work that is closest to the classical Persian Persian epic poet, poetic tradition. Um, all of the Muslim poets that wrote classical works of this nature, long epic poems, wrote romantic, what is called the romantic masnavi, romantic stories about either an Iranian falling in love with an Armenian or an Iranian falling in love with a, 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 a Hellenist princess or an Iranian falling in love with an Indian princess or a Central Asian princess or a, Chinese prince or princess, and each different poet wrote their romantic epic poem with a very similar themes, with very similar ideas and, and um, events. So that section has never been studied before, um, and that was a section I, I researched for my masters. And at the end of the the end of the story is the Book of Ezra. We have nine chapters at the end of the work. Um, which tell the story of the Book of Ezra. And that section was also once published in 1908, uh, also based on only one manuscript by um, Rabbi Dr. Benjamin Zaev Barcha, who was a Hungarian rabbi. And he published it in the Review des Études, which is a French journal of Jewish studies. So for my undergraduate uh, dissertation, uh, I published, I edited, and I, I translated the chapter from the story on the Megillah Esther, which talks about the, the beast, the Mishteh, that Ahasuerus organized. And then um, most recently, I've been looking at the Shiro Mahasad story. Now, the oldest manuscript we have for this particular poem dates back to 1650 and is currently held in the Berlin Staatsbibliothek in Germany. And that's quite a good manuscript. It has a few gaps, uh, but not, uh, not so many. And the ones that it has are, most of them are quite short. There are a couple of long gaps, but it certainly has over 90% of the, of the work. Um, and I'm currently working on producing a comprehensive critical edition of this, this specific work. So approximately 90 to 100 chapters of 6,500 lines. And I'm hoping to use about 10, 10 manuscripts um, in paragraphical edition with various uh, indices, etc. So that's my main, that's my my core, my core thing. Now the uh, the interesting thing about this story which I, I spoke about in my masters is that what you can see is we start with first of all um, the book of Esther where the Jews faced physical destruction and then we move on at the end to the story of Ezra where the Jews uh, were able to rebuild the temple resettle the land of Israel and we had spiritual uh, redemption. Um, now, the bit in the middle, the story of Shiro and Mahasad, um, has no one has really paid any attention to it. And I was the first person actually ever to seriously give any thought to what on earth it's doing there and what its function is. Um, and one of the things I suggested in my dissertation, 
which I think has has some legs, is that basically this story is functioning here as a kind of allegory, and that in the same way that um, Abraham kicked out Hagar um, and kicked out Hagar and kicked out Ishmael, um, so Achashverosh basically kicked out Vashti, and with Vashti, ultimately, her son as well, in this case, this her fictional son, Shua. Um, and Mahzad is a princess, and she has a relationship as a daughter-in-law to Achashverosh, Adashir. And Shaheen, in his work, is contrasting the behavior of Esther towards Achashverosh, and the behavior of Mahzad towards Akashvela, towards Ardashir. Uh, as we know from the Megillah, Esther is extremely polite, extremely modest. She's very uh, decorous in her speech. Um, and in this poem, Shaheen makes it very clear that Mahzad was a bit of a, a bit of a bully, extremely rude, didn't know how to address the king politely. Um, what happened was at the end of the story, Shiro gets killed, he drowns, and Mahzad wants to take the body and the coffin back to China so that she can bury him there and she can set up a mausoleum in China. So she's taking Ardashir's oldest son, dead son, fresh, fresh, right? The, 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 the body's not even cold yet. And she's taking, she, she charges it in and she says, I want to take your son off to China with me. Um, and compare that, I compare that to how, for example, Esther, when she approached the Achashverosh, Ardashir, she was very polite, she was very hesitant. She, she dressed up first. She, she prefaced her request with a lot of uh, uh, obsequious words invited him to some feasts, etc. So what Shaheen is doing is contrasting the non-Jewish Shiro with the Jewish Koresh. With what I've not mentioned so far is, of course, during this poem, Ardashir and Esther have a son, and the son in this story is called Koresh. Okay, it's called Koresh, and he grows up side by side with Shiro. So Koresh and Shiro grow up side by side, Shiro is the older brother. Koresh is the younger brother. So on the face of it, Shiro is going to become the, the emperor of Iran. He dies. And so who becomes the emperor of Iran? Koresh becomes the emperor of Iran. And what does Koresh do? He's the one that facilitates the events of Ezra, according to Shahim. And he sends the Jews back to Israel, and he allows them to rebuild the temple. And so the other point that I made in my dissertation is that we actually see um, that Shiro is being made out to be an enemy of Israel because he's stopping, by his very existence, he's stopping the Jews going back to Israel. Because if he becomes emperor, Koresh doesn't become emperor. If he doesn't become emperor, Koresh will become emperor. And we know Koresh will let us go back to Israel. But Shiro's enemy number one. Shiro is also enemy number one because he's directly descended from Nebuchadnezzar. We know from uh, uh, the Gemara that uh, in Megillah that, um, that Vashti was descended from Nebuchadnezzar. And we know from the Apostle King Yishayahu that uh, there was prophecy that God would wipe out Nebuchadnezzar's sea. And so Vashti got killed and her line was wiped out. So Shaheen keeps it going for a bit. She gives him a, he gives, he gives her a son. Shiro still dies, according to Shaheen. And so Nebuchadnezzar's line is wiped out. But from the Jewish readership's perspective, the Jewish Iranian readership's perspective, Shiro is a bit of a tragic figure here. Because if you're Jewish, and you know that Shiro is the son of Ashti, and you know that Yishayahu has prophesied that Nebuchadnezzar's seed is going to be wiped out, then you know that Shiro is going to die long before he does die. The moment he first surfaces, you know this guy's a marked man, because he's the son of Ashti. 
He's the great grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He's dead. He's walking. He's dead man walking. And so there is a there's an allegory going on here about Shuo being the guy, the nasty guy, stopping us getting back to Israel, and Koresh, his brother, being the the good guy. That's one element that's going on here. And the other element that's going on here is that Shiro is portrayed as being a major hunter, major um, fighter. He's, he's uh, an archer, an archer. And who else was an archer? Ishmael was an archer. Uh, he engaged in, so he also engages in some immoral behavior. He's obviously a non-Jew, so he's an idol worshiper. Who else was an idol worshiper? Ishmael was an idol worshiper. But there's one other person that was an idol worshiper and that tried to stop the Jews going back to Israel. And that was Bilam. Bilam also tried to stop us going back to Israel. And what happened to Bilam? His donkey was pushed off the path by an angel. And when the donkey didn't do what he wanted him to do, what did Bilam do? Bilam threatened the donkey with death. He said, I'm going to cut your throat. If I had a knife now, I'd cut your throat. Okay, that's what he says to the donkey. And then later on, after he's made that threat to the donkey, the angel reveals himself to Bilal and says, yeah, hi, it's me, right? I was standing in the way of the donkey. I forced the donkey to leave the path. Okay, but we only know that after the donkey has left the path and after the threat has been made to slip the donkey's throat with a knife. Now, exactly the same chronology of events happens in the story of Shiro and Masod. We have a whole story in this uh, epic poem where Shiro is out hunting, he gets lost, he gets lost from his army, and he blames his horse. He eventually find, he does find his horse, his horse runs off into the woods. He eventually finds his horse after he had to sleep at the top of a tree all night got attacked by dragons, because I got saved by dragon after being attacked by wolves. And he eventually finds his horse. And what's the first thing he does when he finds his horse? He says, if I had a knife now, the moment I get back to the army, I'm going to slit your, your throat with a knife. That's what Shiro says to his horse, which is exactly what Bilam said to his horse. And... Um, and the same chronology happens here as happens in the Bilam story. Only after that threat has been made and after the horse has deviated from the path and been put back onto the path, do we have Mahzad turn up and say, you know what? I was the hidden power that forced your horse to get lost. I was the one that did it. Um, and the same way as the angel had that function in the Bilam story, Mahzad has that function in the Shiro story. And Mahzad is also sometimes referred to as a Pari. Pari, pari is a is a Pers Persian name for a fairy. We we get the word fairy from the Persian word Pari. But, but it means uh, someone who's very beautiful. Um, but it can also mean something like a, a creature like an angel. So let's move on. So I know we're taking up a lot of time on that. Um, the third work, the third work that, that Shahin wrote was called Bereshit Nami. At least that's the name Bach gave him. And this was written 26 years later in 1359. And Shahin tells us, Shahin tells us that he was only persuaded to write this work by a friend, and that when he did write it, he was old and he was poor. But it's a fantastic poem, um, and like his previous works, it's also a versified rendition. Um, with midrashic content of Horatius. It's also extremely long. It's nine and a half, nine and a half thousand lines. I have not studied this work and I'm not going to be looking at it as part of my PhD. Uh, but it has been a very, it's become very popular, a very famous, shall we say, because the last few chapters by Yeshev Tavayachi relate to the story of Yosef HaTzadik and Potiphar's wife. And in Muslim culture, this story is often referred to as the story of Yusuf Basalecha, which is um, a story that's often popularized in, in, in Persian poetry. 
So Dr. Julia Rubanovich of Hebrew University is currently um, doing some research on this poem, and she's hoping to put out uh, an edition of this particular section of Bereshit Name. And she's said she's going to use at least three manuscripts, three of the oldest manuscripts that she's got her hands on. And she's written an article about it, uh, which I've given the details of there. Um, so mm -hmm. telling, telling us all a bit about it. Now, so I wanted to show you some of the manuscripts themselves. This manuscript here is, this is a page from the manuscript that um, Rabbi Barker used in his uh, article for the, the, the RBJ in 1908. Um, so he, th he thought at the time this was the only manuscript in existence of Ardashinane. This manuscript was owned at the time by Elkham Nathan Adler, who was the son of the chief rabbi. Um, Elkham Nadler had a, a big collection of uh, Iranian manuscripts, uh, Persian manuscripts, Arabic manuscripts, which he'd gone and collected on a trip to Iran. And uh, he let uh, Barker look at it. Barker thought it was amazing. It's an excellent manuscript. And uh, there, there was a German uh, researcher who did a PhD in 1966 in Tübingen, uh, also on Shahin, also on Arda Shunane. And she also uses this manuscript. By the time she uses it, it's um, owned, it's been sold to the JTS in New York. Who basically they, they bought all of Nathan Adler's manuscripts. Um, it's been dated, we think, to the 18th century. So again, it's not very old, but it is one of the best manuscripts that we've got for Arda Shinone. Another manuscript that we have for Arda Shinone is this manuscript, which is held in Berlin. Uh, this is folio 1R, um, and the manuscript's called MSOR Quartz 1680. It's been dated to approximately 1650. Um, again, this was also used by Dorothea Bieske in her 1996 PhD. She focused on the first 16 chapters of the work, and she published them with a German translation but not in Hebrew letters. She changed it all into Islamic script, even into Arabic letters. This manuscript is very famous for its illuminations. It's got very nice pictures um, of some of the, some of the events, uh, or some of the chapter heading pages. There are some nice pictures that were drawn in, we think by probably Muslim, Muslim artists. And you can tell that this was commissioned this copy was commissioned for a wealthy patron because the everything's nicely neatly laid out clear boxes with gilt colored edges around the the, the text um and it's a very good manuscript it's the one that i've been used as my base manuscript for my work on my masters and it's the base manuscript i'll use for my edition it has lacuna, um, gaps in the text. Some of them are obviously lacuna because someone has ripped out the page with the nice pictures on and sold them as a separate page, which is what book dealers tend to do. Um, and uh, so you got might have one whole folio missing, but you only might only miss six lines of the text because if you've got a picture on one side of the folio with three lines of text, and then another picture on the other side of the page with another three lines of text. If that page is missing, you've lost two of the illuminations and you've only lost six of the lines. So there's a lot of, a lot of scenarios like that in this particular manuscript. Um, but the, 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 the damage in terms of the missing lines is not so enormous. There are a few other gaps that are a bit longer. Uh, this manuscript was donated to the by Professor Ernst Herstfeld, who was Jewish. He was a renowned archaeologist in Iran, and he fled to the United States when the Nazis came to power, and his papers are held at the Smithsonian. 
So this, I just wanted to point that out because this was not a manuscript taken from someone during the Nazi regime. Um, now, this manuscript is a, uh, another manuscript of also Arbashirame, the, the book that I've been researching. And this one is also held at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York who have the largest collection of Judeo-Persian manuscripts um, outside of Israel, I think. Um, this one is also, this manuscript is also quite old. It's been dated to six, between 1675 and 1749. The, pair, the, the, the way they date the manuscript, you can date the manuscript either on the basis of the paper that was used, or in this case, because it had illuminations, um, it's possible to take a view about the style of the illuminations and some of the features of the painting. And on the basis of that, you can also view as to whether the style was characteristic of a certain period or an early or later period. And uh, there's an academic called Moline, Vera Moline, who's written and published a book in 1985 called Judeo-Persian Illuminated Manuscripts. That uh, was published in Cincinnati in 1985. And she's got, and there you can find a lot of the illuminations from all of these manuscripts. This one and the Berlin manuscript, and also a couple of others from the other the other poems that Shaheen wrote. Um, this also, you can see this manuscript, the fact that it's nicely laid out and it had all the illuminations suggests that it was written for a, a wealthy patron. Okay, now this, this slide is a bit complicated, okay? And I'm going to admit that up front, and I apologize for it. But uh, there's a lot of information on here that is new um, and which has been part of my recent focus of my research. I'm going to start with the bottom, the bottom, the bottom line. Um, in 1973, Professor Amnon Netzer from the Hebrew University published in Iran, in Tehran, an anthology of Judeo-Persian literature. Okay, and that was called Iran. It's an anthology of the poetry of the Jews of Iran, and it was published in 1973, and it was reviewed by an eminent professor of Persian literature, uh, Dr. Sajardi, and he wrote an article in a journal, a literary journal called Rahnamoy Kitab. And both Netza in his book and Sajadi, in his review, asserted, and, and that's asserted it subsequently on numerous occasions, that prior to him publishing his book in 1973, basically there was no knowledge in Iran of Shaheen and his poetry, no knowledge in Iran of any of the other Judeo-Persian poets or Judeo-Persian literature in general. And Sajadi repeats that in his review. He was he, he should have known. I mean, he was an eminent Persian professor. He also says, I've never seen any reference to any of these Judeo-Persian poets in any Persian literary works that I've seen. As part of my recent research, I've uncovered a few facts that would suggest that both Professor Netz and Professor Sajadi were somewhat mistaken. Um, now, Shaheen was extremely popular in the Jewish community, um, but largely unknown in the wider Muslim society. Now, what I've recently uncovered, and I've only found one reference to this in, in Israeli or Western uh, scholarship on Shaheen, there's an article that was published in 1965 in Tabriz by a very eminent Persian that Persian literature professor called Ahmad Bulcini Ma'ani. Um, and he wrote an article in 1965 for the Tabriz University Literature Journal about um, the story of Yusuf and Zuleikha, the story of Potiphar's wife and Joseph, which, as I said, was a very popular theme in Persian poetry. And he wrote an article about this, and he starts his article talking about Shaheen. In 1965, he starts talking about Shaheen. 
And he tells us that in, uh, I need to check the dates, this is still a work in progress, but if I'm not mistaken, in 1830, a copy of 1831, a copy of a Shaheen manuscript was sent from Boucher, which is in southwest Iran, by the local governor of Boucher province, and his name's there. It was, he sent a copy of a manuscript off to Mashhad, which is in the far northeast of Iran, and he wanted to have details of Shaheen's work included in a book that was called Taskire, and it was in fact included in a Taskire, um, and it was included in a Taskire, which I'll explain what that is in a second, called Anjuman al Udabar. So this is a book, and it was prepared by the editor Khan Haki Amiri Tabrizi. And in that book called Anjuman al Udabar, there is, in page 244 and 245, uh, a discussion of, or a description, shall we say, of Shaheen and his poet poem about Potiphar's wife and uh, Yosef Hatsabi. Now, Taskira is basically uh, a history work that uh, lists and describes all of the poets and all of their works. So if you wanted to do the equivalent in English literature, you would have a, a literary encyclopedia of, of English poets. It's, it's, that's basically what it is. A Tazkira is a literary encyclopedia of poets. And it was an incredibly popular genre in Iran. We have some examples of it in the early, early Middle Ages, 1200s, 1300s. But it became supremely popular in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, literally hundreds of these works were written. Um, literary encyclopedias, listing the poets, telling us about their lives, what they did, where they lived, what they wrote, what it contained, when it was published. And so if you wanted to know about a poet, you would go to one of these books and you'd look him up. But if you wanted to look up a Jewish poet, as Professor Sajadi found out, it was very difficult to find any reference to them in these works because the Muslim, there was Muslim people writing these works and they didn't know anything about the Jewish poets. So, mm -hmm. however, Professor Gulchin and Arni clearly did come across uh, one such work that did mention Shaheen. And the reason that he probably was the person that came across this was because he wrote the definitive work, the seminal work in Persia on this particular genre. He wrote the history of Farsi Tasqueline literature. It's a two volume work, a copy of which is in the National Library here in, in Jerusalem. And he published that um, about 70 years ago. And that is. Um, the definitive work on this particular genre, and he lists every single book of this type uh, that has ever been published. Um, and he lists uh, this particular work, Antiman or the Bear. However, there's more to it than that. Um, not only does Professor Gortini Marani tell us about the fact that this literary encyclopedia listed Shaheen, he tells us a few extra pieces of information um, two of the most significant pieces of information are that he claimed, and he doesn't give us any evidence for this, but he claimed that the Jews, the Jews in Boucher, where he found this, this manuscript, knew Shaheen's personal name to be Shaul. Um, and up until now, it's been generally accepted that we don't know what Shaheen's real name was. Shaheen was just his, his pen name. But uh, Gulchini Ma'ani says, no, um, I've heard from the local Jews in Boucher that the tradition is that his personal name was Sha'ul, but he doesn't give us any evidence. He also said that there was a tradition that Shaheen had converted to Islam and had been Muslim for about 30 years before later returning to his Judaism. Now that's a very interesting piece of information because one of the big things that comes to your mind when you look at Shaheen's oeuvre 
and you look at his works and the, and the dates of his works, as you see this great big 26 year gap between Ardashir Nama in 1333 and his Bereshit Nama in 1359. That's 26 years. What on earth is he doing in those 26 years? Right? A poet of his stature in the Jewish community would have carried on writing if he could. He, people would have carried on buying the poet's poems and, and funding it and, and reading it. Where did he go? Now, if if Gulchini Mahani is correct, and if Shaheen did convert to Islam, that would give us an explanation for what happened to him during that period. And again, the fact that he came and wrote the Rishit Nome right at the end of his life when he said he was old and he was poor, that fact that he wrote it then could be evidence of his return to Judaism. Someone returning to Judaism might want to do something very public to, to make a statement about the fact that he has rejected Islam and is now back in the fold of being Jewish again. So it's a very interesting suggestion that um, Professor Gulshini Ma'ani makes in his article in 1965. Uh, he also makes one other suggestion. Uh, he says that he, he himself personally saw a manuscript of Shaheen's work, of Shaheen's Bereshit Nami. And he said that there's a guy called Rabino who um, owned this manuscript and took it abroad out of Iran and was selling it in the early 50s. And he very much wanted to get his hands on it and buy it. But he couldn't find anyone with the money to buy it. And so he didn't buy it. Um, so what I'm trying to find out at the moment is where this manuscript went, because we know that um, there was a Rabino called Mr. Hyacinth Louis Rabino, who was the British consul, British consul in Rasht in Iran in, 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 in the early, early years of the, of the 20th century. He died in 1950. Some of his manuscripts were sold at Sotheby's in 1955. So that's a story that's yet to finish because I'm still looking into that, but I'm hoping to track down that manuscript. So this is, that was Iran. Now the rest of the world, Israel and Europe. So I've mentioned Rabbi Shimon Chacham. He was a Bukharan Jew, came to Israel on Aliyah, lived in Jerusalem. And he published most of Shahin's works based on a single manuscript. Then I've mentioned Rabbi Barcha. He published the article about with the Ezra chapters in the REJ. And he also published a number of other articles about Shaheen and Judeo-Persian generally. And then in 1965, we have uh, an Israeli, well, an Iranian who made Aliyah from uh, uh, Iran to Israel called Hanina uh, Mizrahi. He published a book called The History of the Persian Jews and Their Poets. Uh, we also have it in English. Right. So he published that in 1965, and that really brought to home to the Israeli public that there was such a thing as Iranian uh, culture, Jewish culture, and Judeo-Persian literature. And then we have, subsequent to that, um, a Danish academic called J.P. Asmussen. He published a whole series of articles also about Judeo-Persian literature. And then we have Professor Amnon Netzer, uh, who was a professor at Hebrew University, he published numerous articles before his death in 2009. And we have uh, Walter Fischel, who also published a few articles to discuss uh, this subject. And also Dr. Vera Marine, who I've mentioned, I mentioned her book in 1985. He's also published numerous articles on, on Shaheen. Okay, so now um, there's an there's a academic um, planter at the moment in, in this particular field of, of studying the Jews of Iran, and that planter is the fact that, that historically academics have tried to suggest that Iranian Jews 
did not have access to rabbinical texts. They didn't really own any rabbinical texts. They didn't. Uh, they didn't. They didn't um, study rabbinical texts. They did, uh, there was no way for them to get hold of rabbinical texts, um, and, and this has been the prevailing view in in, in scholarship. Um, and I've listed here on this slide um, detailed uh, an article from uh, an Israeli journal, Ta'amim, published by the Machon Ben Svi, article by my former professor Shaul Shaked, who was the doyen of Judeo-Persian studies in Israel. He wrote in his article in 1985, um, I've quoted it there in the middle, Bolet, the Yetes Se'et, a Machso, the Sifut, Hagut, with the Sifut, Parshanut, Bahalapa. He says there's a complete absence, almost a complete absence of, 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 of Parshanut literature amongst Iranian Jews. Um, and, and that's was historically the prevailing view. In particular, in the period after the Mongol invasions, when they came into Iran and the whole region and destroyed everything. In the prevailing view, was they destroyed all Jewish books, everything was either burnt or thrown into the river or taken away and plundered. Um, and, and there was just nothing there. Pe the people were dead, the rabbis were dead, the books were destroyed. There was just no Yiddish kind to speak of in Iran. So, as far as the book, th 1300s are concerned, my research is trying to push back against that perspective. And for the period from 1600 to 1900, uh, there's a very good book that's recently been published, which I wanted to draw to your attention, which is has been written by a professor at Yeshiva University, uh, Professor Daniel Sadiq, published this book, which is Yehuda Iran. The Sifut Rabbanit. Uh, it's published by Mossad al It was published in 2019. It's an excellent book. Um, and here he tries to push back against this view for the period of 1600 to 1940. Um, now, his period, he's got a lot more material than I have in my period. He's got telegrams, he's got letters, he's got uh, all kinds of articles uh, by missionaries, Christian missionaries who visited Iran. A wealth of material that just doesn't exist in the 1300s. Um, now, his focus was the um, modern period. Um, and for him, the period of the 1300s was a, side, was a side issue. It was just background. He occasionally mentions it. Now, I'm going to talk, I want to talk briefly about some of the rabbinical commentaries that we do have attested as existing and being copied in both the Mongol Iran and the post-Mongol Iran of the 1300s and the 1400s. And I've listed here some of the rabbinical commentaries that we know for a fact were copied in Iran or existed in Iran during this period, because we've got a manuscript that attests to them. You've got a physical hard copy manuscript sitting in a library that was copied in Iran and has this rabbinical text in it. We have Rabbi Moshe Bar Sheshet, his Perush on Yumiyahu. We have Rabbi Avraham ibn Ezra, his Perush on Iyah. We have Rabbi Avraham ibn Ezra, his Perush on the Torah. And we have Rabbi Yaakov Sikiri, his Perush on the Torah. And we have Rabbi Saad Yagor, Perush on the Torah. These were just five rabbinical commentaries um, from people that came from the West um, that I have discovered during the course of my most recent research. And so we're going to tell you a bit about these people. Who was Rabbi Moshe Bar Sheshet? He's not the most famous of the Rishonim. He, we don't even know his date of birth and death. We think he wrote most of his work in the period 1190 to 1200. He was born in Spain. Uh, we, uh, his editor, SR Driver, tells us that he tends to cite Moshe Kimchi, but doesn't really cite the younger brother, um, Rabbi David Kimchi, the Radak. So 
that's the basis upon which driver is able to say he must have lived for 1200. Um, he also mentions, um, we know that um, Moshe Bar Sheshet is, um, is mentioned by Judah al Havizi in his famous book, Tachkamoni. If you've studied Hebrew literature, you may have heard of Tachkamoni, a very famous work. Judah al Harizi was a very famous poet. He traveled all over the Middle East. Uh, and he wrote Tachkamoni, actually, not when he was in Spain. He wrote Tachkamoni when he was in Iraq. And he was in Iraq in 1220. Um, and that's when he wrote Tachkamoni. And in Tachkamoni, he mentions our Rabbi Moshe ben Sheshet. Now, so our Moshe Bar Sheshet left Spain, he moved east, right? Because if he was mentioned by a guy sitting in Wasit in Iraq, in 1220, he must have been in Iraq. And we also know that uh, there was a famous poet from Baghdad who was his student. So here we've got a, a rabbinical commentary that was probably written in Iraq at about the year 1200. We know the Yerogiyo Miyahu commentary and a uh, Yechesko commentary because we have those who survive. We also know that he wrote a commentary on Yishayahu. We haven't yet located a manuscript of that, well, so it may not have survived. But the point I want to make here, this was a rabbinical commentary written in the east, in the Iraq region, just before the Mongols burst onto the scene in 1220 and started destroying everything in their site. And it was written just before the Mongols turned up, and it survived. It survived because we have a copy made in Iran after the Mongols were in power. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra. Abraham Ibn Ezra is extremely famous, one of the most famous Rishonim you could have. He lived from 1092 to 1167. He was born again, also in Spain, in Toledo, he wandered all his life, Italy, France, London. He wrote Hirushim in almost every place he lived. He wrote his first commentary on Priheles in 1140 in Rome. He wrote his Eob commentary also probably in Rome. And he wrote his commentary on the Torah. He wrote two commentaries on the Torah, a short one and a long one um, in Verona probably. And he's alleged to have traveled very widely, uh, even wider than Italy, France, and Spain and England. Uh, there is a suggestion, but there's not much evidence for it. Right, there is a reference that I've quoted there. There is a suggestion that before he went to Rome, 1140, he had, he had traveled widely in the Middle East. But we don't really have much evidence for it. Anyhow, his commentaries also, we have evidence they were copied in Iran in the 1300s. And this is the manuscript. It's uh, in the Bodleian. Bodley and MS Hunt 567, so 147 folios. And Daniel Sadik, who, who wrote this excellent book that I was telling you about a minute ago, he was the only person that I've seen ever mention this manuscript. He mentions it only in passing because it's not really core to his argument. And he, he mentions only the first item in the manuscript. He mentions that this manuscript contains uh, a section from Rambam's Mishnah Torah on the Zikin. And it was copied in Tampariz in Iran on Sunday the 3rd of Sivan, possibly in 1300, although uh, 1310 also had a Sunday 3rd of Sivan. So um, Neubau says it was 1300, Beit Aryeh says it was 1310. And it was copied by a gentleman by the name of um, Daniel, for his brother, Sar Shalom Ez Adawla. And that's um, that sticks. Adola suggests that the patron who ordered the manuscript may have been a high up person in the regime, a Jewish, Jewish, obviously, high up person in the regime, some kind of government officer or minister. So on page 178 of, of this book, um, Sadiq mentions this manuscript and tells us that it mentions, includes Mishnah Torah. Great. Right. 
Okay, so I'm impressed. Um, and then I carried on. I had found this manuscript um, through other means. And I, I went, I was looking at Sadek's book to try and see whether he happened the chance to mention this manuscript because, well, it wasn't his period. It was very much in his argument to, it supported his argument. So, so yes, he mentions it. Okay. I carried on reading onto the next page, on um, page 179. And now he starts talking about Rabbi Yeshahu ben Yosef from Tbilisi. Now, we, you and I were talking about Rabbi Yeshahu ben Yosef from Tbilisi a few minutes ago. He's the son of Yosef, who was the acquaintance or the friend of Shahim, which you've seen the name before. Now, Sadiq tells us that the son may have been born in Iran. Uh, other people suggest that the son of Shayahu may have been born in Baghdad, circa 1300. And we know, and I've mentioned this in my masters, the Yosef of Tbilisi was a communal rabbi in Gagra, in Georgia, on the Black Sea coast. Now, what's very interesting, what, what surprised me, having seen that Rabbi that Professor Tzaddik mentions the manuscript, he comes along and he tells us that Rabbi Yeshahu ben Yosef of Tbilisi, in his rabbinical works, he, he quotes. Rabbi Moshe Bar Sheshe, and he quotes Rabbi Avram of Ezra, but to my surprise, Professor Tzaddik didn't tell us in his book that it's in the manuscript he's just mentioned. Obviously, he could quote Rabbi Moshe Bar Sheshe and Rabbi Avram Ibn Ezra, because it's in the manuscript he's just told us about, but also has the Rambam in, but he doesn't mention that. So, I was a little bit confused as to why he didn't mention it, but I think the reason he may have overlooked it, A, it wasn't his focus, he was looking at the later period, but there's there's a slight uh, problem with the Israeli National Library website where it catalogues um, digital manuscripts and they, they split manuscripts up and they create separate entities, separate entries on their online system when a manuscript has more than one work in it. So it could be that Professor Tzaddik could see all of the entries. Now, when I looked in the manuscript, I saw that it had these two commentaries, Moshe Bar Sheshet on Yom Yahu, and Avram Ibn Ezra on Eov. And uh, I've pulled out for you here. Oops. No, I don't want to do I've pulled out for you here the catalog that Neubauer prepared in the 1880s. And you can see that he lists here Moshe ben Sheshet, starting on folio 85. And he tells us it's already been printed. And then after that, he tells us we've got Avram ibn Ezra, a commentary on Job. And he tells us who the patron was who ordered the manuscript. Now, what happened a few years ago was they put out um, some corrections to Neubauer's catalogue. And Professor Beit Arye from the Hebrew University went to Oxford and did some comprehensive work and updated the catalogue, published a co-agenda. And in his comments on this particular manuscript, Bodleian MS Hunt 567, which is also often called Neubauer 608, because Neubauer gave everything new numbers. Um, so this under this manuscript, he tells us that not only was the Ramban copied in Tabriz in around 1310, but he states his quite explicit opinion that also the other commentaries, that is the Moshe Bar Sheshet and the Avram Ibn Ezra were copied in Iran near Tabriz at about the same time. What that means is that at the same time as Rashid Dean was writing his world history on including us the, the Jewish history, and before Shahin wrote any of his poems, and before uh, Yeshaya, sorry, it's a mistake, Yeshaya, the son of Yosef Tbilisi, wrote any of his works, Ibn Ezra and Bar Sheshet's commentaries were circulating in Iran and were being copied in Iran. Okay, so what we can learn from this is that if something's copied on a certain date in a certain place, it doesn't just tell us about the copy that we have in front of us. It also 
tells us that the, the manuscript that was used from which the copy was made must have also been there before. And that's called the Vorlage, the previous version, the previous, the original copy. So the copy from which this manuscript was made must have already been in Tampines before 1310 for it to have been copied. Now, what's interesting, and this is a side point in a way, but it does contribute to clarifying why scholarship has somewhat overlooked this issue. No one in any of the editions of these texts mentions that the manuscript was copied in Iran. Right, so S.R. Driver, who was at New College in Oxford, he published Bar Sheshes' commentary in 1871 in London. And he, he calls the book a commentary upon the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel by Moshe ben Sheshet, edited from a Bodleian MS for the translation and notes by S.R. Driver. And he doesn't, not in the title, and as far as I can see, I don't think in the text itself, he doesn't tell us the specific manuscript, possibly because he didn't think it was important, he didn't think his readership would care. But he doesn't tell us which specific manuscript was used. And he certainly, even if he does tell us that, he definitely doesn't say it was copied in Tabernese in Iran. So anyone picking up this edition that SR Driver published in 1871 would not know that the manuscript that he used was copied in Iran in 1310. No way of knowing unless you went and looked at Neubau. And Neubau was, an only, was written 16 years later, right? Neubau already had Driver's copy in front of him. There was no way of knowing if you read Driver's edition that the manuscript he used came from Iran. You can see on the page here, sorry, I've, I've actually provided you with a picture of the manuscript itself. This folio is the last page of the commentary of Jeremiah and the beginning of the commentary on Yechezkel at the bottom. Then if we move on uh, to, the, to Ibn Ezra, so this is the Ibn Ezra on Eov, the first page of his commentary on Eov. Got it here. And... This um, this manuscript was used in a recent edition of um, as Ibn Ezra's commentary on Eor, published by Mossad al in Jerusalem in 2009. Uh, this, that edition in 2009 was the first time ever that this manuscript was used for an edition of this text. And in his introduction to the work, Rabbi Goodman lists all the manuscripts that he uses. And this manuscript is number two on his list. And he doesn't use the word Iran or Tabriz in his description of the manuscript. He describes it as Mizrahi. Yeah, 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 yeah. the name of it, Mizrahi. Right, it could be from anywhere. It could be from Spain, Italy, Greece, Cyprus, the Balkans, um, Egypt. It could be from anywhere. Just Mizrahi. Right, so again, if you pick up Rabbi Goodman's edition of Avram Ibn Ezra on Eov, you have no way of knowing that he is used as one of his most important manuscripts, a manuscript that was copied in Iran in 1310. The only way you know is if you look at Neubau. Okay, so now, now that was 1310, but we can go back one better. We can go all the way back to 1262. In 1262, we have a manuscript that was copied in Tabriz of Rabbi Avram ibn Ezra's Torah commentary. Okay, now there's a, a, a collection in the St. Petersburg Library called Firkovich. Firkovich was a Karaite Jew who was also a librarian, and he went around the Crimea and Israel and Egypt buying up manuscripts. He used to clear out Genizas and buy up manuscripts. But unlike um, Schechter and the Cambridge Geniza, Firkovich was only interested in really top quality stuff. Firkovich went out and he used to buy, he went back to St. Petersburg with huge volumes, books, really old books, solid, whole, whole books, not just 
not just fragments. There's something called the Ferkovich II collection, and that's got some of the best stuff in it. Some of it is Ghanese and fragments, but a lot, a lot of stuff's in there, very interesting, and not all of it's been catalogued yet. So this manuscript, which is MS EVR 2A 0242-2, is a Hebrew manuscript sitting in St. Petersburg. It was copied in Tabriz in 1262, and this is a screenshot of a couple of lines from the manuscript on the last page. And you can see it says, I've underlined in red, Nishlam Perush Hatoya Asher Piresh Haraf Hagodol Hamufok. I think this says Hamapulpal, the Dikduke Hatoya Harav Rebi Avrom Ben Rai Morenu Goin something, Rebi Ezra. Okay, but Ezra's El, Ayom Venora, but Abob, uh, uh, not sure what that would be. Looks like a hey, but it should be a Tara hey. Should be Baal Bush of the Shabbos, but anyhow. Uh, but this this is the line that tells us that this is a commentary of Rabbi Avon with an Ezra that the scribe has just copied out in Tabriz in Iran in 1262. We only have four, four folios. We have four folios. The last four folios of the commentary. Dafka, we have our luck. We have luck. Those four folios included the, the evidence, the, the, the description of who wrote it and who was copying it and, and where it was copied. Otherwise, we wouldn't know. So we have evidence that Ibn Ezra his commentaries were being copied in Tabriz in Iran in 1262, barely 100 years after Ibn Ezra himself passed away in Spain. Okay, there's a couple of other manuscripts I was going to talk about, but I'm going to skip them because I think we've run out of time. Um, I'll just talk about this manuscript. Uh, this manuscript is held in the British Library. MSOR9968. And this is another commentary also written in the 1300s, early 1300s. It's called Torah Samincha, and it was written by a rabbi called Rabbi Yaakov Skili. And it's believed that his family may have had roots in Sicily. Um, now, he wrote his commentary probably after 1318 CE, and we know that he must have written it before 1337 CE because of certain things that he says. Now, this particular manuscript was copied in Yazd in Iran in 1545 CE. So admittedly, 200 years later. But like I said before, if someone's copying a manuscript in Yazd in Iran in 1545, the, 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 the manuscript they're using as the source is already there. Right, it didn't. It didn't suddenly arrive yesterday. It must have been there for a little bit of time beforehand. And if it wasn't permanently in Yazd for a long time before 1545, the likelihood is it was floating around in some other city elsewhere in Iran um, for the previous period. And maybe it was in Tabriz, and someone brought it to Yazd because someone in Yazd wanted to copy it. But the likelihood is the previous, the original that this copy was made from had itself been circulating in Iran for, for quite a period before this date. This manuscript was purchased by the British Library from the Gasta collection. Gasta was the palace of the Spanish and Portuguese community. I think it was the chief rabbi, actually, of the senior rabbi of the uh, Spanish and Portuguese community at Beres Marks. And this is the opening page of his of the manuscript. And you can see he says, I'm calling it the Colossive Torah Samincha. And he tells us that he wrote it. Asati Dam Sadati Varachti Ani Yaakov Sikili Dainu Kanal Zal Al Yadi Al Yadi. And we know very little about this gentleman, but what we do know is that he was originally from Spain. And he studied under the Rashba, Rabbi uh, Shlomo Banadares. And he is believed to have made Aliyah to Israel. 
and then subsequently moved eastwards to Iraq, because elsewhere, either in this work or another work, he mentions that the the river Pras and the river Chidekel are the Artsenum. They're in our land, in our country. Um, and you can only really write that if you're sitting in Iraq. So the, the guess is that he, somehow he ended up in Iraq, having moved from Spain to Israel and then on to Iraq. And it's believed that he is the same Yaakov ben Hananel that is mentioned by the Rashba in one of his Shutim, in 1318, the Rashba mentions that one of his students, uh, certainly Yaakov ben Rebchanano, had made an agreement with a friend of his, Rabbi Chizkia, that he was going to make Aliyah and he was going to live in Jerusalem within two years of that date. So it would seem to be that our commentator here, uh, Yaakov ben Hanania Skili, was in Jerusalem from 1320. And then thereafter moved to Iraq. And then thereafter, his manuscripts would have then reached Iran. So the point that I really want to bring out here in terms of these commentaries, I've brought two examples here, or a number of examples, but two really standout examples. We have an example of Moshe Bar Sheshet, who wrote his commentary in Iraq before the Mongol invasion. And this survived and was copied in Tabriz after the Mongol Way of power. And then we have an example of a Spanish rabbi moving to Iraq via Israel during the Mongol reign, during the reign of Abu Said in 1320, and his commentary circulating in Iran after that date, from that date. Because we know because it was copied in Yazd in 1545 and it was written in Iraq in 1320s. So it was circulating in the region in the, in, the, in the time before that. So both those commentaries provide us with evidence that there was rabbinical commentaries, there were rabbinical commentaries entering Iran and circulating in Iran, both before the Mongol invasion and during the Mongol rule. And there were active scribal activity going on in Tabriz, in Yazd, and in other Iranian cities during this period. And um, that's it. That was, that's enough, I think. Does anyone have any questions? Or if I just... There you go. Go on, Right. So, yeah. So let's start from the top of this line. Sari duchta udonish tarikat makhul umachzan ne hakika. Dovo chuba sukh besham ukard as choy harif norm ukard. Me mash the machozin karam bud vovash se vokho. No, it's a bit bigger. Ah. Um, Sinash. Fourth line. Sinash says, Sahal Bon, Yeish Zikin, no Subhan, Uwa, Chubadid, Kaud, Jepo, Jabo. Dash, 
Silas Gai Hail of Marimas. The Shrewd Lele Aval, Gaudibe Azu Jehoni Mukmal, the Gift, the Moajaz Zu Jehono, as Kofi Honor the Nad Gonwa. The Gone Bessie the Fish Cadu Dow Dowie Davoi Wish Cadu. Bunyo de Assos de Bunyo de Assos Upu Dali Levo Beh Mahabu. That's the whole page. Wow, thank you. Um, yeah, it's quite difficult slightly because uh, there's unwritten, the, the vowels are not written here. There's no vowels there. So if you look at this manuscript there, this page, You've got all these um, diagonal lines on top of some of the letters. So that they're being used either to indicate one specific vowel or to indicate that the ha is a ha as opposed to being a ka, or the um, pe is a fa as opposed to being a pe, um, or gimel is a rain as opposed to being a g. Um, yeah, and then you see that under the sum of the gimbals as a dot. So here in the one, two, three, four, five, six line up in the bottom, you can see uh, under the first word there should be a dot, Jabbar, and the second word Jahan, mm. the end of that line, Hajat, and then the jib, Jaboil, Jaboil. So that's Gabriel. Jaboy, uh, Jaboy is um, the name of God. So, um, yeah, so the dot underneath the gimel makes it into a J, a G. Um, yeah, there's a lot of linguistic uh, errors. There. There's a whole separate field looking at the the, the grammatical aspects of. Judeo-Persian and the orthography, how they how they wrote and spelt their words, and um, one one of the whole aspects of, of what uh, what one has to think about when you look at these manuscripts is what, for example, what names did they use? You know, did they use the Hebrew names? Did they use the Hebrew names? Or did they use the, the Muslim names for the, these biblical characters? And what does that imply as to what he knew or didn't know, or what his sources were, or what his readership was, or 